Good evening. Yes, good evening. Uh, Rashid, you're on mute. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, good evening once again. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dr. Amin Ahmed, a member of KMA Research Committee, uh, East Africa Medical General Board. Uh, I'll be the MC for tonight. We're just giving time for more people to log in and we'll be starting in a few minutes. Uh, good evening once again. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I acknowledge the presence of all our KMA National Executive and National Governing Council members joining us this evening. Welcome to today's research and publishing webinar series. The theme for today's webinar is implementation research uh, from science to policy. It's my pleasure to introduce our, uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Gilbert Kokwaro. Professor Kokwaro is a professor of health systems and research director, Institute of Healthcare Management, Strathmore Business School, Strathmore University. He was previously professor of pharmacy, University of Nairobi from the year 2000 to 2014. He has been chair Expert Com Committee on Clinical Trials at the Ministry of Health since 2009. <clears throat> he was the chair of advisory panel for health benefits package for UHC between the years 2019 to 2020 that developed the framework for UHC rollout in Kenya. He's a fellow of the Kenya National Academy of Sciences and the African Academy of Sciences. His research interest is in the area of health systems performance improvement.
today you are talking to us about implementation research from science to policy. I request everyone, every one of us to keep our microphones on mute as the presentations are going on. And please use the Q&A box to type out questions to the speaker. Karibu, Professor Kokwaro. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, having the time from your busy schedule to share with us uh, this seminar. Uh, my mandate is really simple. Given that this is at the end of the day, I'll make it as simple as possible. The whole idea is really not to teach you about implementation research, but to arouse your interest. So I have up 20 minutes. If you allow me the first 10 or so minutes, I'll just go through some key concept on implementation research. And then when if time allows, I'll then show you the next 10 minutes, something close to what we will be talking about, such the implementation research that we have just done. Uh, very interesting enough, in fact, what I'll show you shows my connection with KMA that begins 1998. I'll actually explain to you why, so it's very interesting. So without too much ado, let me just uh, share my screen. Yeah. Dr. let me know if everybody can see and then we can proceed. Yes, you can see that, yeah. Okay, so with your permission, I'll just take a few minutes to introduce people to health systems because a lot, a lot of people have problems with trying to, to see or connect health system, the structure of health system with the research that goes on there. So I will not take, make it too complicated, but it is important to explain because if you don't get that one, then everything else seems to be very difficult. So allow me just in two minutes to explain to you a few, few concepts that were very useful or are found useful and are very useful when we are doing implementation or site. And these are basic, basic health system concepts. So this slide may not be clear, but I'll take you through. Because once you get this slide, it's very, very easy. Whether you are discussing health at WHO, at an institute or elsewhere, if you have this concept, then you are, you are on firm ground. And this is where most people go wrong. And I've found even some of my colleagues, you just wander through health research, implementation research, but really cannot make a sense. So have a look at this slide very, very carefully. I'll explain to you a few important things. One, look that there are several streams, stream A, stream B, stream C, stream D, stream E. And these are really the main building blocks of the health system. And if you look at stream A here, health system determinant, that is the foundation of health system. All the things we talk about health in Africa, health in that kind, you should not even spend 30 minutes discussing them. If you don't get stream A right, everything else will go wrong. Have a look at stream A. So we have there governance and leadership. That is really the key and the main foundation. Governance is stewardship of resources. And if you don't have proper stewardship of the resources, all these other things we are looking for, looking at are not going to work. So under those, I'll just show you a few things. Governance and stewardship stream A should be part of the foundation. Policies and policy formulation. Remember, this was research to policy, but you need to know where that comes in. Policy is at the very foundation of LA health system. So there are problems with the police, three problems. They could be non-existent, in which case the house will not even start. They could be there, but not aligned to the health needs. The house will not start. They may be there, but they are not being implemented. The house will not start. So that's, that's important. 
So the other important thing, part of the thing, just have a look, A2 funds, funding cuts through any talk that you, you want to engage in, in health system. And if you don't have policies that actually look at that right from the beginning, it's very difficult. And A3, adjustment to or alignment to the population needs. Any activity in health should ideally be trying to address some need of a sector or a population. Again, if you don't do that, then you don't go to stream B. Stream B now, those, if these things are working, then stream B forms the inputs. These are the inputs or the resources that you need to A, get the system working and B, to maintain. And look at this, box A, medicines and technology. Box B2, facility infrastructure. I'll come to that and explain to you. 3B, information system. Decisions in health require good leadership. And a leader, a good leader is one who is given stewardship over four assets. People, capital, processes, including clinical procedures and information, that's all. And the, the job description is that the leader takes evidence-based decisions to add value to each or all of those things. So that is why information is needed. And then the health workforce, and then the funds for a particular thing. Then we can now talk of service delivery, and under that particular stream, we talk of population health, facility organization and management, access, which has got several dimensions. It's not just access. And we hope that at, at our stage, we don't talk of access as politician, but access that with the four dimensions, physical access, financial access, linguistic access, cultural access, and other things. That's what's confusing. And then availability of then efficient services. That is what stream C then. If you do that well, then you can go and have a look at what happens in stream D. Output, high quality care, coordination, sustainability, except effective service coverage. Service coverage, again, I'll, I'll cover that in implementation uh, uh, research and, come, and so forth. Then you can look at outcome, good health for everybody. So that's really a good, a good snapshot for those who, who may not be conversant with it. So let me pack that one. Now, this is important. And if anything, if you don't get anything out of this particular seminar, I would urge you to pay attention to this one. This is the foundation of anybody handle. If you can't use this one, you'll struggle in the sphere. And this is what he said. Just listen to me, listen to me. Function defines structure. So the function of any facility or any department or any program at national or global will then define the structure of the health system. It's not the other way around. So you need to know the function. And the function is defined by looking at the needs on this box, where the people. Once you do that, it will determine then what structure will help me to actually fulfill this function. And once you do, the third thing is then structure determines the resources. The resources will A, to set up the structure and be to run the structure. So in a facility, whether you are in, in private sector, you are in the county, you are in a KNA, this is the thing. And then from there on, then you see efficiency in terms of use of resources and that will, will uh, uh, spur utilization, output and outcome. This is a very useful, uh, very useful slide in anything you are doing. Let me leave that alone. The last thing I want to bring to your thing is that there are only two arms of the health system for purposes of today's seminar. One is this one, the upper one. That is public health, domain, promotion, and prevention. When you look, follow someone throughout the, the journey in life from birth here going across there, the whole idea is that if you have a strong public health component here, then most people will stay here in the upper room here. But occasionally, 
people fall ill and then they come down here to the light blue one, which is called the health service domain. Now that health service domain will only work if a diagnosis, appropriate diagnosis is there, timely, appropriate treatment, and then people can recover and go back. The difference between our counties, the various counties, the differences between urban and rural population, the, people, the differences between uh, sub-Saharan African development is really these slides. Is A, how much investment is put to keep people healthy, and B, how much investment is put in the lower part of the third, so that when you fall ill, then you can quickly recover and go back. That's also another very useful thing. And implementation uh, research and science contributes to both, uh, both uh, arms of the, the health system. So let me then quickly go through this one and, uh, and go through the, the main objective of our implementation research. So implementation, so what is it? The definition from this point of view is simply the inquiry into questions, what, why, and how intervention work in the real world. It therefore implies that we need to work with the populations that are affected by the actual intervention, the users of the research, and hence they should be involved in the design and conduct of research. This is totally different from clinical trials. Implementation research it means that you do research in an environment that mimics as closely as possible what is there in the real world. Because after all, that is what will determine the success or failure of any intervention. So number two, implementation research can consider any aspect of implementation, including factors that affect implementation. And you can then cast this into the health system uh, structure that I showed you. And thirdly, the context of the research is very, very useful. Social, cultural, economic, political, legal, and environmental set, it can affect the implementation research. Again, this one is part of the the stream A I showed you there, the third box I showed you there, the, the people in that box, the function of the health system, and then the concepts within uh, any health system intervention is really quite uh, key to the, to the success or otherwise. Then again, this other slide is just uh, the outcome variables of success of implementation. What exactly is one looking for? So there are certain key things, again, that I'll just go through fairly quickly. Acceptability, perception that the intervention is agreeable is one of the variable. Adoption, so in decision to try and employ a new intervention. Appropriateness, fitness, or relevance of a particular setting, to a particular setting. Then feasibility, the extent to which the intervention can be carried out in a particular setting. Don't worry about this definition because I'll show you again in what we are doing and try to show you how some of these factors were important. And more importantly, the implementation cost. This is important because what you want to say, can the health system actually accommodate the intervention? Yes or no? If no, then however good it is, it's probably not going to find itself in policy and practice, as simple as that. At the end of the day, you need to look at the cost. And that's why I said, I also showed you the pillars of financial policies and that's the, the policies determining allocation of funds. So at the end of the day, there's a cost to, into, to introducing a, an intervention into the system. So the, the general question you ask yourself is, can the health system within the given context now, at a particular setting now, be able to accommodate the cost. Because if it can't, then you violate what I would call a very, very simple definition of quality healthcare. And again, people have got problems and even professionals just go along uh, talking of quality healthcare. What is quality healthcare? If you were to be 
taken to a television uh, as a professional to define. You don't say quality is, means it is of good quality. That is really not good. Quality healthcare is simply this. A, it is safe. Two, it is timely. Three, it is effective. Four, it is equitable. Five, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, people-centered. In, in, in other words, it is uh, aligned to the, the health needs of a particular population. Those are the quality, simple qualities, uh, things that you can actually look for in a particular setting. Perfect. So, continuation of the, uh, the, the coverage again, the, of the, uh, the outcome measures of successful implementation is coverage, the degree to which a population that is eligible to benefit from the intervention actually receives it. Again, in the second part of my presentation, if time allows, I'll show you how we, we did this. And of course, there's no point finally in looking at an intervention if it is going to collapse immediately. There's so sustainability to the end which it can be maintained or institutional in a given setting. So these are some of the, the success uh, parameters or outcome uh, parameters that we use. Okay, so again, very, very quickly, implementation objectives, research questions and methods. Explore. Uh, describe, explain, and from that you can con connect that to questions such as what are the possible factors, what describe the context, etc. And then the research methods, you can choose qualitative method, quantitative method, depending on what, you, or mixed methods as you go along. So basically, I think this uh, is an overview of the objectives and research questions and methods that you can do. So I uh, think the purpose of today was not to take you through too much details on that. So what I'll do, just to manage time, if you can allow me and I spend the next 10 minutes or so showing you an example of an implementation research we undertook in Kenya and just ended a few months ago. If I can stop sharing and again, Dr. Min, you'll tell me whether I've succeeded in loading the new slide. Let me just stop sharing this and then show you the other one. Okay, share screen. Yeah. It's working just fine, Professor. Ted, can you see? Yes, yes, Prof. Okay, okay, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much. So now this is an example so that uh, if you had missed something in my rather brief introduction, nothing to worry, let me take you through. So, and this is where I want to remind those of you who are too young probably to remember, this is my connection with uh, KMA, right from 1998. So we, I attended one of the seminars that KMA uh, organized. You have been organized seminars and this for a long time and I've attended many of them. There are many in malaria. And I remember that one in particular because during that time Kenya had just switched from chloroquine to sulfadoctin pyrimethamine. And KMA organized a similar thing like this one at, at uh, Sage Hotel somewhere in town there. We were few, we were not taken seriously and a few people wrote some rather unpleasant that we were wasting our time. At that time, my friends in KMA, nearly the entire thing, and myself believed that it was a mistake to move from chloroquine to sulfadoxyl pyrimethamine because resistance was already developing. Anyway, we were proved right because by 2005, Kenya then switched them to, to, to combination uh, uh, therapy for malaria. So I want, now show you another study that we did, which is implementation of multiple first line treatment for uncomplicated malaria as a pilot project, an assessment of health system barriers. This is a study we did in Homer Bay County and Migori County for the last three years, ended last year. It has never been done anywhere in the world and it is 
our group and a group in Burkina Faso that were courageous enough to do this one, to do this study. And I want to explain to you very briefly the, the background to this study, which is linked to what we are discussing with KMA in 1998. It's a long time, but still very relevant. So bear with me. So we did it in co collaboration with National Malaria Control Program. Those of you who are from there probably know that one. And it was sponsored by Medicine for Malaria Venture. And uh, these are the partners. Very, very quickly, this is the background. There are already reports of emergence of parasite resistance to combination therapy, including atomethyl uh, lumefantrine in some countries. And I think it's just a matter of time to before this happens. This is because parasite resistance to antimalaria a social, political, and economic consequence globally. So as a, res as a response to this increasing level of resistance to antimalarial drug, countries switched to atomicity-based co compound in the, in the early 20s. 2000, 2005, that is really uh, where the story I was telling you. But although use of atomism based combination thing is a good, is a good policy, really from a health system point of view, it's a waste of resources. It's a waste of resources because the main problem is the health in Kenya and in Africa I can summarize for you, A, insufficient funding, one side of the coin, and B, inefficient use of available resources. And we think, and we are convinced that use of atomethamine-based combination therapies for uncomplicated malaria until you reach the level WHO suggests, and then you're abandoning is a terrible, a terrible waste of resources because malaria is not uh, a, a priority for, for those with the many. So we need a different paradigm shift on the way we use it. This is where multiple um, uh, treatment for uncomplicated malaria, that concept comes in. So among the strategies that have been discussed is the use of multiple first line uh, therapy for MFT for uncomplicated malaria. But there are mathematical models that have said that it can work, but in real life, nobody has tested it until the group from Kenya and Burkina Faso did it. And I want to show you some interesting results. Now, just have a look at this thing. <clears throat> that if you look at these three diagrams of the left, this person could be taking one combination therapy. You can see that two or more. This one, another one. This is another one. The whole idea is that the original combination therapy is that with different modes of action is that they confuse the parasites. So it's unlikely for the parasites to simultaneously develop resistance to both, both drugs at the same time. So that's it. But we have seen that now that with the long-term use of, of apps, we are having we are having this problem. So multiple first line treatment. Can be uh, can be represented in this diagram on the right. Use the, 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 the diagram of Kenya, for example. So here, what we are seeing is that if in an environment you have a situation where parasites over a period of time encounter different combination therapies, one combination therapy A, B combination therapy B, C combination therapy C, and you keep on shifting those therapies or rotating them in a way that, then the end result is that you will save all the combination uh, therapies available for a much longer than if you are using each one of them individually as of now. This was the concept. Which, so this is the concept that has been around and we set up an implementation type research to try and produce the evidence. So potential advantage of this, which have been theoretical delayed or emergence of resistance, increased overall treatment seeking. The other thing is that probably it will be associated with the higher program cost. But if people are just saying higher, how high? What was the cost? So these are the questions we, we sought to do by doing this in real life. So let me summarize the study very quickly. 
A, the first aim was to evaluate the health system challenges associated with the use of multiple first line treatment for uncomplicated malaria in two counties in uh, malaria endemic parts of Kenya. These were Homa Bay and Migori. Migori was the control where we used artemeter lumefantrine throughout the 36 months study and the neighboring county, Homa Bay, we did some rotation. And the approach was this one, because the study was just 36 months, we had to rotate this over a much sh uh, shorter period that would be there in practice, but we, we managed it. So eight months rotational atomethylumefantrine, which we started with, then amodiaquine plus a test unit, dihydroatomethylene, picaraquine, and, and then pyronaridine a test unit. I'll give you some re uh, key results there. So number, M number two, was to understand the service providers, patients' experiences. We, here we conducted mixed method study. Remember I mentioned mixed method in my previous slide to understand patient providers' experiences. In other words, would they like the approach? Would they like, how, what would be the, the, the experience of uh, the doctors and nurses with this kind? How about the patient? Those are the things in real life. So we collected structure, uh, data using structured questionnaires and we captured the, the experiences. And lastly, like I told you, we determined the cost. What is the cost associated with implementing MFT approach? We calculated economic cost of setting up and implementing MFT. This is important because you remember I told you in one of the variables that it, the cost can the health system actually uh, 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 accommodated. So this was a nice study set up among these lines. So we did it in Homa Bay and Migori County. Let me go very, very quickly. I'll show you the slide quickly. The, those of you who are familiar with that, that's okay. But let me just show you. This is how we rotated it. Again, this is important. So six months before we started, obviously this was at the mid uh, lume, uh, to in all the sites here. Yeah. We use this period to then, this is on the two county, to get baseline data and also to prepare for the, the start of the study. This is the preparatory study. Month zero here, in now in Homa Bay County, that's the test county, dihydroatomacid in Piperaquin, we deployed for about six months before rotating it out. And then the second, after that, we crowded that out with uh, a modiaquine, a test unit here for six months. We did not remove and use medicine. That is unreal. So in the real life, you do it by crowding. So in a facility, where you do that to be efficient, you let all the medicine that you had put there before to be used up and then you do. So we did that for that, that's, that was the rotation. And then that is Homa Bay uh, mainland. Then the last five months, then we reverted back to uh, Atemita Lumefantri. Now in, in Mufangano Island, because it's an isolated island, we did not have experience on use of pyronaridine a test unit, which is, which is a, a new molecule of that one. So we, use, we chose to use that compound in the island for 12 months before replacing it with amon, uh, uh, with the atemethalumefantry. So this, the blue one is really Mfangano and associated islands. This is at a meter room front before we put Pyramax for 12 months and then went back. And then the red, the red portion does represent the control part. That is Migori where we used, uh, we used at a meter room front throughout. So this was a real life uh, implementation research. And we were looking at some of those questions that I showed you. Uh, Dr. Amin, you need to remind me, I have a few more slides. If there's time, I'll just take, what, four more minutes so that I don't overrun the time. Is that okay with you? Professor, we still have more time. 
Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so then let me take them slowly through that so that we get some concept out of this. And some of the concept I'm going to do that are actually, I showed you in the slides, the coverage, uh, acceptability, etc. Now, this slide looks like a photograph of just it, but it is important. The actual study was launched by the governor of Homer Bay County. By then the governor of Migori County had some issues and he was not available on this particular day. People will say, oh, why are you showing you? It is important. This is the context under which we undertook this implementation research. It was very, very, of, of course, it was very, very important that both the Ministry of Health and the county government were comfortable with this study. And here you can see the, the former governor of, of the Homer Bay County there giving them. And they were very, very categorical that they liked the concept, they think we are contributing. This is important in terms of context. And here, Dr. Rashida Mann, who was then the chief CAS, Ministry of Health. So this is important. I'm showing you that in terms, when you come to implementation uh, uh, research, some of these things, political goodwill is part of the context we are talking about. And without that, I can assure you, it becomes very difficult. Remember the title of this thing was from policy, from, from science policy to practice. What, my friend, when you want policy to work, you will need to deal with the politicians and the technocrats and you need to have political goodwill. Otherwise it will not fall. So it is important. We did this and this is part of the, the work we did in the six months before. So I think that one, we can just park that one. The second thing we did was health worker training so that you remember this is going to be real life. The healthcare workers that we are training were the people who are going to provide the services and were routinely providing health services in, in, in the counties. So this one was important. You remember involved them, not only that, but we involved them right into the early planning. So this was not something we just came up with on a weekend and said, we want to do it. Right from the concept when we were writing this thing for funding, we had already gone and, sounded out the leaders of the, the healthcare workers, not only at national but county level, that we intended to do an implementation research that really would be embedded in their day-to-day -day activity. Very, very important. Again, that is the second thing. The context is that it has to be done by the people who are there uh, on a daily basis because this is part of their job. Very, very important how you get in there. So it distinguishes from other research where you can go there with your small research team and, uh, and do it. So we did it in such a way that our role was to train our trainers, the high level healthcare workers and administrators. Then they could cascade it down to up to the, the lowest level because it was just not possible for us. But more importantly, this was their study. It was not ours. We were just facilitators. Very, very important. So what does it achieve? It's, it actually uh, gives you support, but it also offers opportunity for people to refresh their memories on uh, management of a particular disease. So one advantage of implementation research that it gives healthcare workers, whether you are in private or an opportunity to actually get involved in research that luckily is taking place close to or just within the facility where you are working in, and it's actually part of the job you do. So very, very important to involve people. It's capacity building, but it's also, for those of you just listening, it also shows you there are opportunities that you can undertake research, whether it is for, you want to change the policy or you want to just improve your profession. You don't need to travel thousands of there's a lot of opportunity to do implementation research right where you are working. You can occasionally travel out and come to Strathmore go abroad for other things, but the, the main thing, the source of data, the research question, the relevance and how you do this right next to you. So all the, the more reason why I think AMA is on the right track to actually give this awareness that we have opportunities for us to, to train. So institutional improvement, um, improvement of the health of the population and also personal professional advancement are all embedded in uh, implementation research. 
we can park cover. You remember I told you something about coverage as one of the, the indicators in the previous slides. So here we use the concept of co coverage in a very simple way and I'll explain to you. If we went to a facility here, we were replacing uh, atemethyl lumefantrine with the, with the two molecules. What you want to see is that how long does it take for all the facilities, if you go anytime, to find that everybody has switched off from using the previous molecule and is now using the new molecule. That is a measure of coverage. And at this time, as you could see, the replacement was by crowding out, as I explained to you. So it took some time. You did not want to interrupt that. But what we wanted to show, to demonstrate that after some time, the new molecule that was introduced is actually now the molecule you'll find in the smallest facility in the location. And that was our measure of coverage. What were the, what, what, what were the results for this study? Is the coverage went on very well. Despite the hitches of logistical getting it there, we had prepared it there. And nearly every facility, we covered all facilities in the counties that needed them. We did not collect data from all the facilities because A, that would be exp expensive, and two, it would not be necessary. For terms of data collection, we just chose a few facilities. But this is the concept of covering. Okay, we can leave that. Again, this one. Again, using the, the concept of coverage when we replace atemethylumefansin with pyronaridine atesinate in Mfangano Island. Again, that one worked on well. You remember Mfangano Island was a closed uh, island, part of Homer Bay, but we were using there because we wanted to collect more intensive data with uh, pyronaridine atesinate because we, we didn't have enough uh, prior information. It was a new molecule. So Mfangano was uh, a good environment that context allowed that. Again, you can see at a metal lumefantrine, the blue dots, over time you see them disappearing. It doesn't mean that all of them went, I'll explain to you, and replaced by the, the uh, pyroridine attestinate. Now, <clears throat> here also, let me tell you, just for people may, may be asking that, were, you, uh, were we exhausting all the, the stock of Atemethylumefantrin, the answer is no, we were using a reserve because A, <clears throat> some pregnant women and children under five were excluded from, from this particular study. B, a few, we anticipated that a few patients for one reason or another would have problems with the new molecule. So they needed, they needed an alternative. So you could say that what we did is that we left a reserve just to cover for those rather than crowding out everything. And so in a sense, what we did here is that Atemita Lumefantrin became in terms of design, second line, a drug for a facility for the period of the study while we tested this one out. But it's important just to be realistic that you don't exhaust that one for, for the results I've explained there. But in terms of coverage, getting the, the drugs there, we got them well, I'll answer the question, how did you manage that with some of the consequences of the, the inefficiencies we know that we wanted to remove that as a variable. So as a study team, A, we sought, we bought or we got donation of the new molecules directly from the funders, from some of the manufacturers. So we didn't want that to be available. The only thing that the Kenyan government was providing throughout the study was at a method of but pyronaride in atesinate and amodiac in atesinate and DHA PIP, those were donated to us in sufficient quantity to last that one. Secondly, we bypassed the camps uh, headquarters and the, the, the challenges there, and we delivered or the, the suppliers delivered this directly to the, the sub-regional depot in Kisumu. Of course, we did all the necessary paperwork so that from there on, we just uh, arranged with the KEMSA and where possible to, to distribute this to all the facilities. It removed that variable. Or you can say, but that's not real life. Oh, but I think if we had 
that variable not sorted out, it would have been difficult to get this, this study off the ground. So we removed that so that we could then uh, concentrate on real health system challenges. Uh, what challenges did we find? Let me just summarize here. Yeah, despite all these things, there were challenges of some healthcare workers, despite the training not being familiar with the dosage form. Some of the dosage form, especially that were based on different weights, were a bit difficult to, to get used to quickly. I think that was a major challenge. Um, <clears throat> the other challenge we faced, now, now that was that was a study specific health system challenge. A generic challenge which we really grappled with was stock out of rapid diagnostic tests because we were not covering that. So in some cases we could stay for three months because we could not continue, we couldn't have that. Moving forward, I, we, didn't, we had the funds to intervene, but then I think that we would have been criticizing that we were making the study too artificial because if you then address everything you, every challenge that is there in real life, then it's no longer a real life study. So we didn't intervene there. We could have done much as we seen, but that's what we left it. So that's a challenge. Planning a study forward, anybody's planning this one, I think the issue of lab supplies would be something to consider, just to make sure that's not a variable. The third challenge we faced were two. So our colleagues, uh, went on what is called, uh, um, I would call them strike, but they were industrial uh, disagreements which slowed that for quite some time. We had to accommodate that because the molecules were there, there was nothing we could do. What we did eventually was to ask for a no cost extension because we overran the time, that was then. And then as you remember also COVID-19 came and for a while we were unable to continue because People are not coming to facilities. These are unknown. So this necessitated um, a no-cost extension. Again, this is just real life. And it is important for you, if you are doing this kind of thing, if you are doing budgeting, to put in some risks that can go, unknown risks. And uh, these are some of the things we ran. The thirdly, we had a delay in getting um, amodiaquine attestinates from Sanofi. There was a delay of 12 months. It was very, very difficult. The Sanofi, I think, was disengaging from Africa, even the Kenyan office, so it took quite a bit of time. And uh, it was also, unlike the other two suppliers, those are also health systems. Sanofi, up to this time, still asked me how the clinical trial is going on. And they wanted me to be reporting clinical trials. I told them we were not doing clinical trial. We are doing health system feasibility study. But they said that you have to give us uh, how many patients have you recruited? I say, we are not recruiting patients. So it took quite a bit, a bit of back and forth. Again, implementation uh, research to some people is still not very clear. So it took us time to actually clarify that. Those are some of the challenges. Otherwise, I just give conclusion that, A, what did we find? A, number one. Multiple first line treatment for uncomplicated malaria in, in Kenya is feasible, provided there's proper planning to A, train healthcare workers, uh, involve key stakeholders, get the right commodities in place, make sure the lab is working, and make sure that this, this um, uh, continuing monitoring so that you can do that. Uh, how much did it cost? Well, we costed this in terms of what it would require in terms of um, supporting the healthcare workers, the training, and also acquiring the, the, the medicine. Is this feasible? It's feasible. We just looked at those and we looked at what can be done with the current available resources. And remember what we told you that if we can work in inefficiencies, in terms of uh, using the available resources, then it is it is something that's feasible that can be looked for, forward to. What has been the impact? Well, well, we just finished this study about two months ago. We have just written the final report, but I can assure you that just about a week ago and this week, we got a request from one of the funders that 
someone has actually sourced about 25 million uh, US dollars to scale up multiple first line treatment for uncomplicated malaria in sub-Saharan Africa over there. And I think Kenya is a candidate for scale up, Burkina Faso is a candidate for scale up, and they are looking for under 12 other countries where they can do the pilot studies. And I think Kenya as um, Strathmore and National Malaria Control, we have been requested to be prepared that if the application is successful, we shall need to provide technical support to other countries. So I think we are on the right side. So just an example of a success story. Dr. Amin, my apologies, I think I'm overrun. I want to adjourn there so that we have some brief discussion before we conclude. Over to you. Dr. Yeah, Professor, thank you very much, uh, Professor Okwaro, for the informative and insightful presentation. We are now going to have a 15 minute uh, Q&A session and I will hand over the meeting to the moderator for that session. Dr. Chafatso Obonyo, over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Amin. And uh, thanks very much, Prof, for that very comprehensive uh, uh, description uh, using uh, real, real, real world data uh, on how uh, implementation research uh, uh, works in, in, in actual practice in, in our country. I'll just quickly uh, read through some of the questions that have been coming across. Um, if someone was asking, will you send us representations? Um, normally the webinars get recorded and if we get consent from the speaker, yes, uh, we can send you the presentations. Are there CPD points? Yes, there'll be CPD points. This is an interesting one uh, by Dr. Ngubo Kemwa, who asks, why are most government policies not implemented? Is it uh, we don't study the existing political economy and bureaucratic capacity or and bureaucratic capacity, he says, the ability of government structures and systems to deliver on an intention given political, technical, and structural capabilities, how can we include implementation hiccups at study design stage to increase chances of buying by policymakers? I'll, I'll let you handle that one, Prof. Uh, I think the question is why does government uh, hold back progress? I, I think in the US, they normally say the opposite of progress is Congress, because when you say the opposite of pro is con, um, so Congress normally withholds progress. Um, over to you, Prof. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ari. That's a very good question. In fact, just before I came here, we were in another class and almost the same question came in. Why is it that we always have problems with policy? Very good question. Let me give you my thoughts. And you remember, it's a good question because actually he's, he's referring, you remember the strand A of our, our presentation. I saw that's the base and it's very difficult. But let me put it this way. Government lacks status quo everywhere. And this is really the whole thing. They like status quo. And then the second thing, I don't know whether Dr. Tari, you have heard of this joke. Eh? Kenya makes policies and Rwanda implements. I know this because I'm training healthcare managers from, uh, from five African countries, including uh, Rwanda. And, and I found our policies being implemented there. So I won't call it them governments. Why do, I can change the question to say, why do some governments? I think it's lack of information and also government acts only when there's drama. That is why, uh, Dr. if you may allow me, we have problems with promotive and preventive health and we lack problems with actually implementing our primary health policy because there's no drama there. Statistics don't move policymakers. They like drama. And especially if drama is involved, A, they feel they were consulted. B, they think nothing will be done unless they are around. So my, my, my answer there is misplaced fear, misplaced conservatism. And actually, government takes time to embrace new ideas, especially if policy uh, is also the vehicle, policy implementation is the vehicle for implementation of new ideas. So that's the thing. What is the way forward? Get them involved. Stakeholder in engagement. And if you don't know how to, to engage stakeholder, I'll do it. Most of us who have got degrees are always talking of stakeholder engagement without unpacking it. It is time to leave them. Stakeholder engagement is what? Inform 
consult, involve, collaborate, empower. In terms of the government, make sure that the, at least the basic the people who matter, you have informed them. If you are uncomfortable with involving them so that they are able to, to, to implement the policy, give them the impression that you are involving them. I know how to do that. Just say that without you. So make sure that they feel that this A is something that is going to be benefit not only the country, but they, it's something that can also give them political mileage, whether at national level, that kind of thing. Without that, the government, main thing is that whatever agreed, what, not what is there, but what political mileage is there for me to invest in it. So it is us, Daktari, to try and talk the language they, they understand. Let's not, let's go there with the figures from the Lancet. No, let's just make the message digestible. And if they gave us two minutes, they can still remember what you want to say. So one of the thing is also all of us, including myself, we think that the more technical you are, the more thing is okay. But when you deal with the government, don't, not that they are official, not they are, they can't understand. Just make the message uh, simple. And this is the rule. If I can, Dr. Bonio, let me just say it. This is the rule for talking to government. Very, very thing. Have something relevant to say. That is number one. Two, say it. Three, stop. If you follow those things consistently, then you'll have a mileage. Back to you. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Prof. Um, someone is asking, uh, is implementation research cost effective in Kenya and uh, wants to know how they can get access on the final paper of that research. Uh. I, I will change that one. Implementation research is where, actually just to go to what uh, KMR, but implementation research is where we can get the evidence to inform policy change and practice. So to that extent, I would not say cost effective. Is it useful? It is really the thing we should be doing. It is good. You, you remember I was actually, you didn't, I, I spent my time doing lab, lab work in Cambridge. I'm a clinical pharmacologist by training. But after time, I say that, look, implementation research, there's a lot of things. And at the end of the day, the results are not only derived from real life, but you have evidence that is very difficult to shoot down. If you say with the limited resources of research and what, what can we do, do more on implementation research. It will strengthen primary health care. It will give opportunity to our colleagues who feel they are in far flung thing, but more importantly, it will actually show tangible changes that can uh, make a difference in the livelihood and the lives and livelihood of our people. The answer is yes. And remember what I told you, the, the problem is not money in Kenya. The problem is inefficient use of resources. Leave money alone. Pesa machinani is fine, but if you don't know where the, the real deficit is, you can't, you can't take more money. That's really my, 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 my take. Back to you. Great, thanks okay. very much, Prof. There, there are a few questions still coming through the chat. I'm going to just quickly summarize them so that we can have one last round of responses. Uh, someone is saying the country is governed by a dictatorship. That, that's a bit controversial. I think we'll not go there. Uh, I think that's in reference maybe to one of the examples you gave. Um, what are the avenues for budding researchers to get uh, into this area of implementation research? Are there any training programs? Mm -hmm. I think there's, uh, you direct an institute at Strathmore that takes care of that. Uh, have you had ex an experience with an implementation research uh, that proves a suggested study is not practical to be implemented? If so, is this a sort of loss to the for the researcher? Uh, and then the last question I'll take is, is implementation research the same as a thesis? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think okay. we'll go through those uh, last round and then we can close. Yeah, thanks. Very, very, very useful. I really enjoy this one. So very, very quickly, what are the avenues? Oh, the avenues are there. One of the avenues is just KMA. And I tell you, I've been working with KMA since 1990. I'm who I am because I got a good segment of my colleagues through KMA. We have attended so many. Those avenues, if we start now, 
using this to bring is make them avenues for exchange. Then you can, because a lot of people are just floating around. We need to get our professional bodies, especially that's my thing, to reach out to institution to say that are there are some research things you plan that our colleagues can get involved, especially implementation. The thing is yes, yes. And then let me give you things. And I hope our, our next uh, scale up will go up because this is so huge that I would want to involve you. And if it happens, I will send the message through KME for people who are interested to get you. All you need is enthusiasm, nothing else. Nothing will intimidate you and you will be surprised. Actually, the only way to get embedded this thing is to get involved. And if I can involve you right from the planning, you will become more experts. That's really good. So the, are there some practical things? That's the whole thing. In fact, you do it in such a way let me answer that question. Whether where the answer whether the answer is yes or no, it is useful. If it is no, it says that okay, this is somewhere we should not spend more resources in. But we could not make that decision because we didn't have the evidence. If it is yes, then you say it's good. Let us see how best to go. In. So yes, it is where whether you get uh, I can assure you, whether the answers are yes or no, you learn something that we otherwise will not have been. And that's how policy is made. In fact, the negative one will actually feed into policy just as effectively as the positive one. Yes. And then uh, uh, remind me of the other one. There was someone. The last one was someone, I think, asking his implementation research the same as a thesis. Uh, I, I'm not sure what exactly that question so is. Let, let me do this. You, 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 implementation research is an area where you can do uh, work that forms a thesis for higher. Uh, education or a dissertation for higher education. But it gives you the thing because basically the questions you ask there are four or three when you are asked, what is the problem? And you need to write that introduction, whether the thesis is a paper or that is, yeah. Number two, the second question, yeah. Why, what are the implications of not addressing the problem now? Again, you add in that one after that. That's, that's the same way that rare research paper, those, those concept comes in. Because if you don't answer one and two, people are not going to go to the three, number three. Number three is this one. What are some of the solutions you suggest? That's what you describe in, I will do this particular research methodology to try and do that kind of thing. But more importantly, if you are applying for a grant, you say, what are the solutions and why are you the best person to provide those solutions? Remember when you're writing that, no, no, why is my team? That is how it's done. Then fourthly, you say that, what are the implications of the, the, the potential implications of the result of this policy that one? If you do that, whether you are doing a thesis, a dissertation, you are doing a Nobel Prize winning something, those are the main things to go. The thing is, if you one and two are not interesting, people will start dozing off. Back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Prof. We are five minutes past the top of the hour, and I know you have to uh, go for another lecture in, in a few minutes' time. So we want to bring it to a close. But thanks so much, uh, Professor, for that very insightful uh, and informative uh, webinar using uh, real life, uh, you know, real life data from uh, the counties. Uh, as KMA uh, research, we are trying to set up uh, the infrastructural capacity across uh, the country for conducting. Uh, and supporting research. Um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, the, I see Dr. Kigondo is online to just uh, kindly uh, close the meeting for us. Thank you, Kigondo. Yeah, th thank you, Obonyo. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Okwaro for the excellent presentation that he has made. Um, and uh, I think Obonya, we can uh, also invite him in our quest to form the ethical review board uh, to give us a few more tips on how to do that. And uh, I think uh, we will continue with this uh, research series until we are able to generate uh, evidence that can be used to move policy in the right direction. So we want to thank uh, uh, Professor 
for his excellent presentation. I also want to thank all those who have been uh, attending this webinar. This webinar will be available tomorrow on the KMA YouTube page. So you can always listen, listen to it again, and uh, also listen to all the other webinars that we have been having. I want to thank all the people for attending. And with that, I would like to call the meeting to an end. And we'll see you next month at a similar Wednesday. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone, bye bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. And we see you soon. Eh? Thanks very All much, right. Prof. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Bye. Bye.